Um, it has been a long day, so I will be as easy as possible. Um, first, I'd, I would like to um, thank Professor Marmi Stefano for having invited me, and also I thank Raphael for having recommended me to him. Um, my presentation is based on two papers. One is, by the way, um, I'm a dynamicist by training, so uh, my model is My model is based on the theory of dynamical systems. So the first paper is on a single economy with Rafael Duadi, and the second paper is an extension of that with Giuseppe Castellacci. And uh, for both cases, I'm going to use two recent financial crises for the single economy, the US subprime crisis, and uh, multiple economies, the current Eurozone subprime crisis. So, this is the brief outline of the paper. <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to start with this flow of funds. So this is the case of single economy. Um, first, we divide an economy into agents, uh, aggregates called agents, so you can call it economic sectors, and these are the very core elements. So consumers, uh, C for consumers, F for firms, B, banks, including insurance companies, so any institute which act like a bank. And I, investors, and when I say investors, I mean portfolio managers like mutual fund, pension fund, etc. and G, government. So they are the core element, means we take one out of the system and then the whole economy collapses. And uh, there are flows of funds between each pair of agents. And uh, when we generalize the single economy, so the upper index I is the economy I, and uh, the each agent of a single economy has this inherited upper index. So this is your generalization. And uh, okay, when we go back to this flows of a funds chart, okay, now what are they? What does each arrow represent, they represent flows of a fund. And uh, we can divide flows of a fund into two categories. One is scheduled and the other is at will. So scheduled cash flows means um, something is fixed. That means it is predetermined, such as coupons for bonds and installment, for example, minimum credit card payments, salaries, contribution to pension plans, taxes, etc. On the other hand, at will cash flows, they are variable, such as equity investment, debt investment, dividend consumption. But in fact, both are variable because even scheduled cash flows are subject to dynamic relations. For example, even if you are supposed to be paid a certain amount of salary, the economy is bad, and then you get pay cut, then it goes down. And that depends on the economic situation. So indeed, both kind of cash flows, they all end up being variable. Uh, and then there are more flows of funds, contingent. So contingent literally, which doesn't happen every day, such as quantitative easing and the CDS payout in case of credit event. And uh, in case of Multiple economies, there are international investment and international consumption and trade. So we have such case. So let's consider the relation of two economies, I and J, and this is the flows of funds. So the dotted line, they are the domestic ones, and these solid arrows, they are the um, international lending and investment and trade. And I, I is the global agent, and when we focus only on single economy, we just uh, consider this restricted part of I, global I. And when we have multiple economies considered at the same time, we consider just the single I as a supranational agent. So this is the flow of funds for two economies, and of course we can consider more than two economies at one time. Now, what about this? Uh, this is 
an example of contagion in multiple economies. For example, um, let's say I is a debtor country, debtor economy, and J is a creditor economy. And uh, when uh, the problem in economy I is spilled out of the economy and go to J. So for example, I can be Greece and J can be France or Germany, let's say Germany. So for example, contagion from debtor I to credit to J inside the Eurozone. So the red arrow is the contagion of reduced flow of funds. That means reduced means there is an expected level of a flow of funds. For example, Greece should pay a certain amount of money to Germany, but somehow it cannot pay. Then there is a reduced flow of funds. So this is a stage one contagion. Now, what if German banks get hit and then it has a problem pay, um, fulfilling its obligation to its counterparty? For example, US banks or um, some banks outside of the Eurozone. Then the contagion spills out of the Eurozone. So this I call stage two contagion. Now, what is the effect of early bailout? For example, Troika has given Greece funds in terms of, uh, in the form of bailout to prevent those contagion. So this is an earlier stage of a Eurozone crisis. It's the early bailout case, but we don't know how long it's gonna sustain. So this is what we are gonna examine in detail later. So let's just uh, go back to the single economy. Now, what we do is we decompose the wealth of an agent I at time t, so we have this WIT. The, the lower index means agent, and we give the number from one to five to the agent, domestic agent, the CFBGI, yes? as contagion of default, so you really have a marked default and then uh, it produces default. Whereas in here, in this model, uh, it's really, we just focus on the flow of funds to understand the instability of the flow of funds. So the goal is to try to identify when we have this big economy where money is flowing from different agents to another, uh, what is the dynamics of the flow of funds so that we can identify when these dynamics become unstable. And uh, in particular, uh, when we talk of default, it's not a default in the legal sense or whatever that you, one would call default, but just the fact that there is a drop with respect to whatever was expected. Mm -hmm. So that, and then uh, that creates these dynamics. So, you know, you, you receive less money and therefore you pay less money. Even if you're a company, you get a drop in your income, therefore you fire people and so forth. So it's a reaction to uh, Chen. In your sense, I mean, that will be some type of causality in the flow of funds that we are analyzing. <clears throat> Oh, yes, um, actually I haven't used the word default yet, so I just said reduce the flow of funds, but they are the same thing. So by default we mean not the legal default, but reduce the flow of funds. Okay, so, okay, now we decompose wealth in two, two ways. One is this traditional equity debt split, so E for equity, D for uh, debt. This is not just the risky debt as you showed. Um, this is just a general debt. Uh -huh. And also we split the wealth into liquid assets and invested asset splits. So liquid asset means cash or cashable, just something that produces no income. So you, let's say you have a bundle of money, you stash the bundle of money under your mattress, that is liquid asset, but you put the money into a bank and it earns a little bit of interest. No matter how little it earns something, it earns capital gain, then that is considered a uh, invested asset. Now, what is this worth dynamics? So we can build this dynamics of debt, invested assets, and liquidities, and we use the symbols D, K, and L, and this is the dynamics. So I'm gonna skip a lot of details, but we just assume certain things. For example, R is the average interest rate applied to the debt of agent I, and there is this internal growth factor gamma for each agent. What's important is the last equation. 
So how is the wealth of agent I at t plus 1? So at t and the next time interval is related. Um, Wi t plus 1 is Wi t. So wealth at time t plus 1 is the wealth at time t plus cash in minus cash out. The flow, so cash flow in, money in, less money out. And uh, when you look at this index, the, the, this part, J varies from 1 to N, but here K is not equal to I. Means we consider F I I and some equal to the number of weight. So and we should that there is no cash flow from one agent to the other. So the cash flow Fund the transfer from J to I at T. So we have to read the index backward. So Fij is flow of fund from J to I. And this reason is eventually we're going to interpret this, relate this Fij with partial derivative. So for the purpose of this calculation, we set this backward index. And so. We make some basic assumptions on the worth constraint. We first assume that liquidity is positive, means when we run out of money, we take more debt. And maximum convertibility rate. There is a limit to convert um, liquid assets and invested assets, vice versa, back and forth. That means even if we need money, there is a limit to sell off our invested assets, like buildings, equipment, to raise cash, and the other way around. Now, the most important constraint is the borrowing capacity constraint, means we cannot borrow forever. Each agent at given time has a limit to borrow, and that is determined by the credit rating and market conditions. Um, now, assumptions on variables. If each FJI, that, which is the flow of a fund from agent I to J, produces FIJ, for some time in the future. That means when an agent invests, it expects a return from the counterparty and nobody else. And on the normal crisis, the normal times, that means non-crisis times, um, the variables, they satisfy such conditions. But during a crisis, the above assumption is not necessarily hold. That means the violent changes in variables can lead to a crisis because not everything is guaranteed to be continuous. And this is when these interesting dynamics take place. Okay, now, um, the first speaker of the day, Dwayne Farmer pointed out that his paper was not considered lacking economics because he didn't put this maximizing some utilities. So our first version, the, our paper, the first version didn't contain this maximizing utilities, but then we heard the same kind of feedback from a referee, so we've decided to include some maximization problem. So here it is. U is the utility function of on gain X, and it looks like this. Typically, um, the utility is considered only for positive gains, but in real life, loss takes place as well. So we consider such utility function, which is convex for losses, concave for gains. And then we have this probability measure, and then we have this expected utility, which is just the traditional utility over all possible probabilities. But in this case, we are going to use something called the subjective utility, which is based on the, um, the cumulative prospect theory by Kahneman and Tversky, because we'd like to emphasize this subjectivity of each investor, that um, depending on the economic times, they may have different attitude toward the risk. So instead of traditional utility, this expected utility, we're going to use this subjective utility with weighted distorted probability. That means the probability function um, multiplied by this weighting function w. So this is what we are going to maximize. So we have this nonlinear programming problem. We, for each agent i, 
they want to maximize the subjective utility at t. Now, here is the important part. We assume that the probability measure of each agent depends on the time. That means you have one distribution function, whether there is normal or log normal or something else. And I believe that a big flaw of traditional models is many existing models is that they just use one distribution function for all the times, but it cannot be true, which I will show you why in the next example. Because depending on the economic times and uh, situation, people may react. So in the past, people were eager to invest, but now they may prefer just to hold their cash because they are afraid of losing money. So, it will come in a couple of slides. So I just emphasize here that our probability measure depends on the time. And we have this net subjective utility, which is a counterpart of net present value of investment. So we measure the subjective utility, but we just uh, take the net part, which is defined this way. So um, the future expectation or future utility less current investment and each agent wants to maximize that subject to our constraint, positive or non-negative liquidity, maximum convertibility, and the maximum debt constraint. And we will get this optimal flows of funds. So this is our goal, to find FIJ, the, the optimal investment level at each time. The one with the start, the second bullet, that is the optimal solution. And uh, this is a random dynamical system. That means we build this dynamical system this way. We, we define f to be x star of t plus 1 when x measures the state. state. This is a state vector for liquidities, invested asset, and debt. And uh, constraint produces nonlinear dynamics, of course, which makes the whole thing interesting. And uh, the important part is the second one. High leverage makes debt high, and it reduces the borrowing capacity. And uh, as a result, this nonlinear dynamical system, the nonlinear program, the agent can hit the constraint. That means even though they know what is their optimal solution, sometimes they just do not have no choice because they are so indebted, highly indebted. Of course, myopic risk estimation doesn't help. So we, now we have this perturbation analysis. So what we got from this nonlinear programming problem, this one, is a random dynamical system, but we take this deterministic part. That means we just take the expectation of the optimal solution to make the dynamical systems deterministic. And our rationale is that when the deterministic part becomes unstable, then so does random part. So then we apply some theories in mathematics that there is an equilibrium in economy, which is interpreted as a fixed point in mathematics. And again, the rationale is, in real life, the, the economy is closed, and then we are using finite resources with finite participants. So basically, the economy is the, the wealth map is defined on a compact, compact, compact set, therefore there is a fixed point. And uh, a stable equilibrium is an attracting fixed point, and unstable equilibrium is an repelling fixed point. So, excuse me. Yes? You, you, had this, you had this probability distribution, and yes? now you've collapsed everything to a, fix, to a point. So it's like non-random anymore. So does that mean prices, forward prices, or constants? Well, so we have this uh, fixed point, but the, the financial crisis takes place. The trouble takes place when it is perturbed. Because in real economy, in real life, the system is constantly perturbed, right? So what we want to show is that when the perturbation is uh, small enough, then the equilibrium remains on equilibrium, of course, at different level. But when the perturbation is too big, then the equilibrium is broken, and the perturbation spreads throughout the and, economy. And that would be a function of... of we don't, we don't 
whether the flow of money is justified by the fact that you buy an asset, you buy a service, etc. You just look at the flow of money, how it goes. And uh, against, there's, of there's course, no, assets. There's, uh, but no, there's no flow of money without prices. No, no, I understand. But uh, uh, here we just, you know, uh, focus on the flow of money. Uh, in fact, indeed, I mean, there is a dynamics of prices uh, uh, parallel to, the, to, to that flow of money. But basically, it's just... Um, the, the prices are in the in, in the in the in the internal growth. Uh, you you buy an asset, then that that asset uh, increases in value or decreases in value is something that from one time one time period to the next time period, your wealth will increase or decrease because you owe that asset and that asset. But there is no um, in here. There is no seek of any type of equilibrium uh, uh, model uh, with respect to, to the prices. You just, you know, say, okay, there is some randomness in you put money, I mean, as an agent, you, you invest money in another agent and you expect that the, the system will, because of that investment, will give you back something in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, or on the contrary, will penalize you if you don't give that money. For instance, if you borrow money and you don't refund, then you will be impacted in return by the fact that you missed a payment. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a kind of an optimal decision to allocate some of your money to other agent, whatever uh, justifies the fact that you allocate whatever, whatever the rules. Um, I mean, uh, you know, maybe uh, I would suggest <laughs> that uh, we go more to the dynamic aspect of the flow of funds uh, rather than trying to explain, because otherwise we'll be drawn into those type of questions, which are important modeling questions, but we would like to focus precisely on the dynamic of the flow of money and not on the dynamic of prices. But let me just make clear, you gave us this utility theory model with, with probabilities, and then you go to a dynamic system. You're saying that dynamics is a function of the quantities, not well, the prices, and not uh, the expectations. Uh, it's not clear no, that's why the prices and expectations are mean. Or they, uh, it's, they, not, it's not a matter of price as an expectation. It's not a matter of price. The price is in dual space. Here it's an expectation of the investment that you are likely to do. So it's more we are like, I mean, you are trying to extract the dynamic, the, 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 we are trying to extract the dynamics from the flow of funds. We just observe empirically the money flowing, how it is justified when you have a, a, a dollar spent by agent A to agent B. That dollar goes against a receipt for something. That receipt means, you know, a good or whatever. But the fact is that you will see money actually going from A to B. Hmm? And uh, whether it's justified by a bond or a stock, whatever, that's another story. You just see the money going, to, uh, just looking at the flow of how money flows between the different agents. And that's what we want to understand and want to focus and say, okay, well, globally speaking, this looks like a, a random dynamical system. And we want to extract the dynamic part to see how that dynamic part is important or is less important at some periods. So just more like uh, uh, trying to identify uh, when the dynamic part is important, and what are the measure, what, what can we extract as a measure to identify the instability of that dynamic part and so forth. So it's exactly, I mean, so, so the price is, is, a, is a dual problem. The, 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 what we focus on is really the flow of money. So, so you're telling me you can look at the dividend stream in Schiller's graph and without knowing what the prices of the stock market were, you can tell me what the prices of the stock market are. I don't think so. The <laughs> baby. Okay, so I'm not saying I will, we'll see it. I'm just telling that we, we don't focus on it. Okay, so um, again, um, okay, so let me go back to the very first slide and then emphasize, okay, I will give you an overview about what we are doing. So we have these five agents and there are flows of funds between each agent. And what we focus on is that um, there should be an optimal level of flows of funds among each agent. Otherwise, if there is too, too little, then we have this credit crunch or liquidity crunch. If there is too much money flowing around, then we have a bubble. So what is the optimal level? So that is what we are analyzing. So we do all those wealth decomposition and analysis to derive this. So we have this 
deterministic dynamical system, which is the, in the described in the first bullet. So F is the change of state, LKD. But this is not exactly what we are looking for. We just need this to use it in real life because, as Raphael said, we are going to use this historic time series to analyze what is going on and then using that to build an early warning system, which is called an in, uh, indicator, in, market instability indicator. So we derive a resist Jacobian. So as I showed before, wealth can be described as equity plus debt or liquid asset plus invested assets. So we take this liquid asset and invested asset part, and then we build this uh, small reduced Jacobian B. So we have this, the third bullet here. So we have this, this is a first order approximation. Thank you. This is a first order approximation. And then we define an elasticity coefficient, which is a kind of a partial derivative. And I say kind of a partial derivative because partial derivative is continuous, but we have two-sided limits. That means depending on the size, size, sign of the worth shock, we may have a different values. So basically, this elasticity coefficient measures the change of cash outflow with respect to the change of worth. So for example, it looks like this. So WJ0 is this optimal level of wealth of agent J. Now, let's say the wealth of agent J goes down, then um, the uh, elasticity goes down. You, you see this line? But when the wealth goes up, then the elasticity, AIJ plus, it may stay just flat. And why is it so? Because of this different utility. For example, um, when a bank experiences some write down that it didn't receive the money it was supposed to receive, that it may just freeze lending. So there is a credit crunch. So the government decides to fix the problem and they inject money. But instead of lending all the money they receive from the government, the bank just may just sit on the money without lending because they don't know what may happen in the future. So in that case, AIJ plus is just flat. The change doesn't happen. But when they experience a decrease in income, they may just uh, cut their lending. And we can just uh, um, see the same thing for uh, firms hiring people versus layoff and just the hiring freeze, etc. And this is due to changing utility. For example, this is an example. So we have one utility function with the three different probability measure. And depending on the probability measure, Sometimes it is, for example, P1, this is the case of um, growth phase, and P2 is the case of recession, and P3 is just the holding money. So when we calculate this expectation, expected utility, in which case the weighting function is just identity, uh, E3 is higher than E2 and lower than E1. So during the growth phase, it's better to invest, but during recession, people want to hold the cash instead of investing. So because of this, we have this lateral elasticity, this one, elasticity coefficient. Now, what does that do, this elasticity coefficient? We use that to define a market instability indicator. So the elasticity versus the reduced Jacobian, that means the Jacobian matrix from the wealth map, this is how they are related. And then we define this market instability indicator as the maximum eigenvalue of this reduced Jacobian. And in dynamical systems, you have this stability um, analysis that when you have a map, you get the Jacobian matrix of that. And if it has any eigenvalue whose absolute value is greater than one, then the equilibrium is unstable. On the other hand, when every eigenvalue has absolute value less than one, this equilibrium is considered as a stable. And we, we apply the theory to this wealth map, and we define this market instability indicator as the spectral radius of this 
maximum eigenvalue. And uh, by the way, this instability indicator can be empirically observed from historic time series of flows of funds. For example, there is some available from Federal Reserve website. Now, when does this financial crisis happen? So we consider, we interpret financial crisis as a breakage of stability. So we had this nonlinear programming problem. And for example, in case of a US subprime crisis, um, the home buyers, the consumers, they had this reduced borrowing capacity because the house prices against which the day people used to borrow a lot of money against their house because the house prices kept going up. But then it started falling after the second quarter of 2006. So they not only could not borrow as much as they wanted, but they had kind of a margin call. They had to um, pay more, especially when they borrow, took this option arm, um, adjustable rate mortgages. So a lot of people couldn't make the payment and then their houses got foreclosed, etc. So that was a perturbation. And the reason of the perturbation was change in the borrowing capacity. Now, as leverage increases, so do entries of this reduced Jacobian matrix, therefore the elasticities. Now, you have a matrix and the components becomes higher than eigenvalues of that matrix becomes higher. That means it is probable that um, this indicator, sorry, this market instability indicator goes above one. That means the equilibrium is not stable anymore. So this is a one dimensional um, illustration. So the black curve is the original wealth map and we have two different uh, stabilities, P and Q. Now the red is the bifurcation. So after perturbation, um, the original stable equilibrium became unstable, P mu one, and this original unstable equilibrium became stable equilibrium, Q mu one. So the stability type of the equilibrium changed because of the bifurcation. And this is what we consider as a financial crisis in economy model. So when you apply this to this uh, US subprime crisis, the cause is the breakage of the stability. Therefore, we had a bifurcation. And the effect is contagion. What happened in these consumers? The housing market spread to all sectors of economy, not only to banks, but to the industry as well. And of course, the securitization, interconnected agents, and then it created a feedback loop, etc. Now, what can we do? We can use this elasticity coefficient to make the policy more effective. So that means rather than just randomly injecting money into the system, probably the government can decide the target flows of funds and then calculate the elasticity and just the work in each sector. That means when they allocate fund, they should target which sector, how much money to give to which sector, instead of just purchasing bond and injecting money into the market randomly. So targeted fund allocation is necessary, no random handing out. So this is the illustration. So the market equilibrium is broken, and then the economy enters a recession. Um, Mateus mentioned something similar about the chaos and the dynamical systems. In terms of dynamical systems, a recession is really, really nice because that is very stable. But economically speaking, we do not want to be there. So the government artificially creates chaos by stirring the economy to break the system. So we don't want to be there. So uh, as a result of government action, we have this chaos and then that boosts up the economy. And that is to prevent a deflation or recession. 
Okay, now we apply this to uh, the result of single economy to uh, global economy. So basically what we, we are doing is that we just dump all the agents of multiple economy into one big pool and then just uh, we shift the index. Um, so the upper indexes, they represent the economy and the lower indices are the, the agent. So for example, um, FKIJ means flow of a fund from agent J to I in economy K. And uh, these are the relevant, the corresponding Jacobian matrix and the elasticity matrix. And then this particular case, FIJKL, that is this um, cross-border flows of a fund. So that is flows of funds from agent J in economy L to agent I in economy K. And then we also generalize our definition of elasticity uh, coefficient this way. Now, the difference between A and B, uh, we had this relation of okay, elasticities and Jacobian matrix, and they are the same off the diagonal. And because of that, we have the following uh, embedding. So this is the global elasticity matrix, and the, the each block is a local embedding, the embedding of local matrices. But we cannot say that in terms of the Jacobian matrix because of the block, of the block, uh, because they have this relationship uh, along the diagonal. Now, we define Contagion, uh, we give a quantitative definition of a contagion. So we say that contagion in a global economic system occurs if given two time intervals. So we have this one. So at time less than T0, the economy is stable. That means the global indicator is less than one, and each local indicator is less than one. And after some time T0, there is one local economy in trouble. The, the global economy is still stable in terms of this indicator. But at time t, the global economy is not stable anymore because of this indicator. Rho bt is greater than 1. And there is an off-diagonal element which contribute to this global instability. So. So here, um, when there is non-zero off block element, there is a contagion. And when all these off diagonal blocks are zero, that means um, we have only these diagonal entries. That means we, even, even if the global indicator is greater than one, that is an occurrence of independent financial crisis. But there is no contagion, according to our definition. So it is this off-block element which contribute this contagion. See, like this. Okay, so now how do we apply this to this Eurozone? So um, as a case study, instead of considering the entire Eurozone, we consider just the mini Eurozone and mini global economy. So we divide this mini global economy into three groups. The group one, the preferred economy, the five countries, and group two, the major creditor, creditor countries in the Eurozone. So we assign six to France and Germany, seven to Germany, and then from group three, we consider the US. So we have this respective elasticity matrix and the Jacobian matrix. So, this scenario was made a while ago, but it doesn't have to be Greece. So, so eventually, the Greek sovereign debt was restructured, but we consider possible, all possible cases, whether it is restructured or not restructured. So scenario one is Greek sovereign debt is restructured. That means payment from Greek government to French bank goes down, then it will change the elasticity this way. And we can say the same thing to German banks. The fear for Germany and German French and German banks will go up, 
and eventually market will reduce their exposure to French and German banks. And then European Central Bank and Federal Bank, they will lend to French and German banks. And we have a very possible post Lehman type credit crunch. So this is the case when um, the Greek sovereign debt is restructured. The second scenario is when it is not restructured. We have a similar problems. So uh, there is still a higher probability of global financial crisis. What about scenario three then? Fear factor. If French banks and investors lose confidence in Italian sovereign debt, for example, then this is how the net subjective utility changes and how it will affect the flows of a fund. So F4356 means um, the flows of funds from French banks to Italian government. And the next one is the German counterpart. So the Italian sovereign bond wills will soar and the risk of Italian default will arise, but this is not due to contagion. Contagion according to our definition, our quantitative definition, but this is rather a fear factor. So current issues, what, what kind of issues do we have? So in case of group one, this, this five peripheral economy, austerity deepens recession. So my opinion is that austerity it just makes things worse. And the main um, problem of those economies is lack of competitiveness and government overspending, and everybody knows about this. And the group two. France shares a lot of problems with the group one, uh, mainly lack of competitiveness and government overspending. The problem with this monetary union is that Countries with weak competitiveness, they cannot depreciate their currency, therefore get out of the trouble. So is there any way they can, people can create currency depreciation effect inside the Eurozone, in, inside the monetary union? If this can be resolved, then probably we can have some kind of a solution. Another problem outside of Eurozone is this U.S. fiscal cliff. So depending on what happens about that after the election, it can impact. It can have a huge impact to this world economy, and then you can just drag the recovery down and just bring everything back to recession. What about China? Many people have pointed out that the growth of Chinese economy has slowed, but is it? the result of the financial crisis in the West, or it is a domestic problem, mainly the SOEs. So there are a lot of state-owned enterprises, and uh, very little private enterprises are active. So do they, have they hit the limit, or they are just uh, slowing down because of what is going on in the West? So this is the current issue, of course, which is still going on. Now, let's compare this Eurozone crisis with this Asian-Russian crisis. So although they look similar, the Asian crisis, they are independent crises, and there was no contagion in our definition. So basically what people did, the, the investors from the West did was they, they packed their money and left. And uh, there was some kind of a shock in the market, but eventually the crisis the, the perturbation was absorbed and uh, it didn't spread globally. That each individual companies, they saw, uh, individual countries and so forth. And Russia was impacted due to this lack of diminished demand of commodity. But again, they, the crisis mainly contained in Asian countries and Russia and it didn't spread to the West, for example. And uh, in terms of the elasticity matrix, the matrix, the off block matrices are zero. That means there was no contagion to other parts of the world. So the conclusion, work in progress. What I'm working on currently is I'm just verifying the model, the market instability indicator using this US flows of funds from Federal Reserve. So the main problem when verifying this kind of model is lack of data. So for now, I'm working on this flows of funds from Federal Reserve, but we have this problem because 
I have this consumer that is independent agent, but according to the data from the Federal Reserve, households and the hedge funds and the private equity funds, they are aggregated as, as one sector. They are grouped as one sector under the name household and non-profit organization. And I haven't figured out how hedge funds and the private equity funds are considered non-profit organization. So my biggest task right now is whether I can separate those two groups or I have to just uh, deal with the existing data. And in case of Eurozone, whether um, I can ever find any data to like, apply this market instability indicator to the entire Eurozone. So this is, and other things. So the theoretical, empirical, these are the work in progress. So I would conclude. <laughs> <laughs>